Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Welcome, everyone. We're really excited to have another episode of Cooking in Mexican from Z. I'm one of your hosts, Alon Sanchez, alongside my beautiful mother. And um, here on Cooking in Mexican from Z, we try to focus on ingredients, on topics that celebrate Mexican cuisine and culture. And what better, what better moment to do that and, and, and focus on a topic I think that also relates to my upbringing and my mom, uh, you know, having the, 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 the guts and the will to bring us to the Northeast uh, as, as a place of our upbringing and our home. And we're talking about right now how Mexican food mo- migrated to the Northeast. And we could be talking about just that in the United States, but also in Mexico. So I think we're going to touch a little bit about both. Hopefully we can throughout this process. And and to help us and to aid us through this process, we have a beautiful, beautiful guest. We have Lori Flores, who um, uh, has many different accolades. And we're just talking a little bit offline about, we can't mention all of it, but her bio. Uh, Lori Flores is an associate professor of history at Stony Brook University, which is a great a great university, uh, where she teaches classes in U- U.S. Latino, labor, immigration, and food history. So imagine, all those topics are being tackled by this amazing woman who's going to be sharing her knowledge with us. And uh, she's also the author of an award-winning book, Grounds of Dreaming, Mexican Americans, Mexican Immigrants, and the Californian Farm Worker Movement. So... Those are just topics that I think touch uh, touch my mom, myself, and many others. So, with that being said, welcome, Lori. We're absolutely excited to have you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to talk to both of you. Mm-hmm. Outstanding. So, tell us a little bit about your story and 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 how. Why, why, why do you think that you were chosen for the missions that you're taking on, and why do you think that this was your calling? Uh, well, I, like you all, um, I spent a lot of time in Texas. So I'm a Tejana. I grew up in South Texas in a little town called Alice and grew up there all my life. Had no real exposure to any other part of the country before I went to college on the East Coast. And that was a culture shock for me. Um, I, you know, Grew up in this sort of rural community, small town, um, particular type of food, you know, speaking about food, I was used to Tex-Mex food and learning so much more about um, food during college and then on to graduate school in California. I was just exposed to a lot of different, not only cuisines, but a lot of different ways of making and eating and celebrating Mexican food in particular. So I feel like my journey has been jumping from coast to coast to coast, because then I ended up back here on the East Coast to uh, be a professor here in New York. And what I realized, you know, after I finished my first book on California farm workers, is that my passion is in talking about the labor that goes behind the making of so much of our 
food system, the way that we, um, you know, nurture and indulge ourselves on a daily basis, that is the product of the labor of a lot of different hands that help us get the things that we love to eat and drink every day. And so I wanted to work on something new that included farm workers, but also included the restaurant workers, the street vendors, the people who work in warehouses, um, all of the different people along the way who help get us our, our food, you know, in our restaurants, in our school cafeterias, in, you know, hotels, resorts, um, on the streets, all of these different spaces where we eat and enjoy and share food with one another. So that's how I came to the academic interest in the topic. But I think it's brought me full circle because it's helped me understand, um, you know, that Tex-Mex food that I grew up with at the very beginning. I'm now understanding like how rooted that is in history and how different Mexican food has become over the decades in the United States. Yeah, I just want to make a comment that I don't have a lot to do with feeding all those poor farm mm-hmm. workers during the... I mean, he and uh, another friend set up and would go and take food directly in California yeah. to the yeah. fields. Yeah, and I think it's important to mention, you know, thanks, Mom, for bringing that up, Mom. But, you know, one of the things when the pandemic hit, obviously we were all at, at the mercy of, of, of the situation, but... I, I I just remember going to a supermarket. I'm like, this is, restaurants are closed, but food is still getting here, right? And I wanted to I wanted to realize what that 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 chain was and how it was getting there. And you know, uh, some dear friends of mine we went to Oxnard, up to Ventura in California, and brought burros to everybody. And just to quickly, you know, you know, you know, share the the the, the point, you know. We got there with all these grandiose ideas of being able to talk to them and tell us their story and figure out, you know, what was there, what was going on. They gave them 15 minutes, by the way, to have lunch. And the thing is, they get paid. They get paid on bales, on boxes. They don't get paid by the hour. So every, they were like, "Mira, qué toda madre aron that you gave us some food and a, a beautiful burro and a little soda, but we got to get back and chingarle." You know, and, and it, it was very interesting. So just, and I, as you know, Lori, so. Yeah. Was, uh, you know, when you're talking about paying by the shovel or the bushel or whatever it is, I remember when we were doing stuff at the restaurant, making tamales or something. I said, we're, no estamos pagando por pieza, eh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, okay, mom. It's all good. But, uh. You, I mean, Lori. So obviously, from an academic approach, you have a lot of um, sort of familiarity with with that. I think that narrative. And how do you see your work and everything that you're doing moving forward? And how can we help? And how can everybody else help? To be honest, mm-hmm. yeah, it's something that you know, professors and academics, especially if they work on modern issues, it's something that they feel every day that pressure of like, yes, we can write about this stuff and research about it. How do we communicate our ideas to the wider public and to have, you know, just the everyday person interested and wanting to do something um, in terms of food justice. And that's one reason that I want to, um, you know, obviously keep writing for the public, but I did create this digital restaurant map that is now on the internet. um, That's like this love letter uh, to Mexican restaurants in New York and the history behind how they've really increased in number. The earliest Mexican restaurants in New York City were all the way back in the 1930s, and it was just a few of them, and then a few more in the 1950s. And then when Zarela, you know, came to New York with you and um, your brother, it was that was the beginning, I think, of this renaissance in Mexican food in New York. It was this combination of 1980s Tex-Mex and then Mexican regional food and Mexican food both at you know lower and higher price points. It was just this really interesting decade where Mexican food started flourishing in New York City. And people who walk around New York or any major city today, I think they take for granted that Mexican restaurants are a feature of, you know, the places that we live and work every day, but it didn't always used to be like that. So the pioneers who created the first restaurants um, in major metropolises, they, they were responsible for all the different kinds 
of ways that we can acquire Mexican food today. So I made this digital map to show that long history. You can look at different years and see how many Mexican restaurants existed in New York at that time. You can compare it to today. You can look at the street vendors that are in different boroughs like Queens or Brooklyn, Staten Island. It it was a really cool project to work on. And I hope that people find it like a fun way to, you know, look at the history um, because, you know. My mom was not only just part of the exposure and the introduction of Mexican regional flavors. She was also part of the, the American regional uh, launch. So it was Alice Waters. It was all the Texas chefs, you know, so it was also American regional cuisine. And my mom was bringing that to, to, to the forefront. So she was on two different levels yeah. you know, at that yeah. time. Yeah. I think it's, in, it, it's incredible because I think, you know, Alice Waters did some amazing stuff, but she had these counterparts, right. Including Zarela, including other people in different parts of the United States that were doing that same thing. So I'm so glad you brought that up because, it, yeah, it's like two timelines at once, like two accomplishments at once. Well, the point I wanted to make is that maybe you could put in a link to your map. You oh, know, yeah. That'd be and great. your face, you know, for, for announcing you because I think that would be very good. So the, the other thing about me coming to, you know, at the time that I came, it was all of a sudden not just Mexican regional food. It was like you know, different kinds, you know, Thai food, and it was just a really exciting, you know, Felipe Rojas Lombardi. All the, it was a Tommy kind of like Tang, a, Tommy yeah, Tang, Tommy Tang, Papa Dom, all and those And bringing all these regional foods. And it was just like the, the, the beginning of the Renaissance. I mean, that was just one part of it. Yeah. And Madhur Joffrey was also near you, right? The Indian restaurant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and Celia Chang and, and San Francisco and all these iconic, iconic figures that continue to influence the way that, that, that we eat today. And I'm happy that you did the map because I tell people all the time, I think like in because I'm a football fan in the football world, they have a, a coach's tree. So this coach. Um, you know, sort of mentored this coach and he became the head coach for another place. I think they should do the same thing with chefs. I think in culinary schools, they should be taught this beautiful culinary tree and all the chefs that have spawned from from those chefs and being a mentor and inspired by them. Oh, yeah. That's and, I think, and I think that's really, that should happen. And I just, so to teach the young generation, you know, about that. So, you know, go ahead. I'm sorry, Lori. So your, your point, yeah, that's... No, Talking I about think the, that, yeah, um, yeah. the genealogy behind it. I mean, just like anything else, there are roots and there's training and there's mentors and there's people who shape others and and shape the food. And I think, the you know, and the ingredients. Yeah, exactly. And so especially with all the different waves of entrepreneurs coming through and, you know, that's another thing to think about is like, who do we think of as an entrepreneur when it comes to food? It's not just the person who owns a restaurant. It's also that person who's running that street cart, you know, every afternoon or morning or evening, like they're a business person. And so it, the map also acknowledges like the smaller businesses that are, you know, roving around the neighborhoods or on your corners that you see every day. And, and we wanted to acknowledge them as well. And that what I personally think too, as I think, you know, cause that, you know, my scholarship where I put Latino kids into culinary school and, you know, they go to CAA, the Aron Sanchez Impact Fund, now it's called, which is something that we should talk about because now we're going to be able to touch the migrant farm workers, you know, the educational system now because we a, 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 we're casting a larger net. But real quick, I think culinary schools should give you the foundation of, a, you know, whatever 12-month program, give you the, the techniques necessary in order to tackle that, and then you should be allowed to major, like as you will. So you can major to be a street cart vendor. You can major to be a caterer, a personal chef, a recipe developer, a food historian like yourself, an academic. You should be you you should be allowed to major in these different areas of food service. That way, because you're not disgruntled by going into the restaurant business, which is very difficult and the success rate is very small. Yeah. So cultivate your love for food with those experts in schools. That's my personal opinion. I would love to think what what whatever you guys what are your thoughts? Well, I don't know. They could do a whole major on it. I think you'd have to have a basic 
a basic course the first year, and then the second year specialize in your, you know, in your major. Yeah, but I think six months is enough, Mom. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe a year. You, who knows? But I'm just saying you should be able to major in, in your specific area of food service. And that includes the academia, Lori. And that's what I'm saying, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I love this idea <laughs> myself because, like you said, Aaron, it's you don't want someone to get discouraged just because one sector of the food industry you know, is not um, doing what they hoped it would for their career or for them and and their presence. And so I think, you know, what, if anything, the past couple of years has taught us is the word pivot, right? (laughs) Um, And I think so much of how we think about the food system, about food education, um, the possibilities of food careers, um, that's, I think that's one way to sort of get people to not uh, lose hope when, you know, the restaurant business, because it, it is still a really hard world uh, to make it. There are plenty of other ways that you can be a creative and a professional in the food industry. Well, you know, what's interesting about the Latino po- population is that we're so entrepreneurial. You know, during the during the, the COVID and everything, people were selling tamales, they were selling, you know, all, all sorts of things in the corner. Everybody was making a little bit of money. It didn't it didn't hurt quite as much from what I understand. Yeah. And there was that whole phenomenon of ghost kitchens, right? These kitchens that were previously places that either weren't getting used or were being used, but people didn't see them, you know, the behind the scenes work. And and then people were selling food out of their homes, out of these ghost kitchens, these invisible spaces. I thought that or, that was or fascinating. Their cars. Or their cars. Or their cars. In this building. That I live in, this woman comes into the car and she has taken orders. Oh, and they're really? mostly from Guerrero. And then she says, and, you know, you ordered this fish and you ordered this. And the, and the food comes packed individually with different kinds of food. It's, it's oh, really wow. interesting. Right to the door here. Huh. What do you think, Aaron? I love that. I love that idea. I, I mean, you're right. I think the idea as... Um, as Latinos, and especially when you talk about the Mexican diaspora, how how much we're being redefined as what our cultural identity is, right? And I think now, uh, more so than ever, I think we have to find those links to what uh, what defines us a little bit. And I think right now we're in a very interesting time because I think people are more so than ever very uh, uh, very conscious of. Um, what they can contribute and what they can share and how you do that. And I think we're living in a very interesting time where, you know, the restaurant business is not where you can work from home. And it's interesting, you know, like I'm thinking to myself, shit, you know, everyone was doing their thing and making money at home, but you can't do that in our industry. You have to show up. And I'd just be interested to think think of your, uh, your thoughts, Lori, on how the food landscape has changed during the pandemic during all this really kind of challenging time? Yeah, I I think it's changed so much. I, I think in some ways it's been really good that, you know, more of America or, you know, the nation woke up to the reality that we were taking a lot for granted. We were taking for granted that restaurant staff show up every day. And we were taking for granted that our groceries are packed on those shelves in the stores every day, or that we could go down to the corner store and get that quick thing we needed, um, or that we could go out for a meal with friends with no worries, you know, all of that changed. And it's been just total. it's broken open a lot of our assumptions about how easy it is to get food, because it, it has always been really hard for certain people, only they've been less visible in the landscape. And I think what COVID has done is made more of those people visible, and made their health a priority. Like we need to talk about their health, not, you know, just medical, but mental, social, like what kind of support are we giving to food workers of all kinds? You know, um, I think that's what COVID helped us think about. Preach, preach system. <laughs> I love it. Canta. No. And, and, and you know, what's interesting is that inevitably when I go to restaurants or I go out to eat, somebody from a Latino background is going to come out and say, I don't that's our guy, you know? He represents us, right? Okay, you know, what, one of the things, that, what, the other impact that, that I think that the Latino have made in New York is that 
they have got to move from dishwashers to prep cooks because the labor is so short here in, in New York that a, a lot of the, the, the Mexican guys are working as chefs now. And all different kinds of things. And you can't get, you can forget about getting like a, a an expensive, you know, well, first of all, the, 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 the minimum wage is $50. So that, ha that has really impacted the money that people have made in restaurants. Yeah. And I think like it's changed food media too. I think, I think we just have more food journalists paying attention to different kinds of outlets like it's not it doesn't have to be the traditional restaurant anymore it can be like a pop-up it can be um these more temporary you know things that are happening with food and collaborations between chefs across states across nations right like um we've been seeing a lot of that work but laurie there's a lot of self-anointed experts you're an influencer you're uh, a block. Just because you go out to eat doesn't make you necessarily an expert. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, have you done, a, you know what I mean? Have you done, how do you, how, how do you, how do you evaluate that? And how, have you done a culinary deep dive into all these places and what allows you to give you that kind of platform? And that's very interesting and not frustrating, but it's, I'm just taking notice of that. Yeah, totally. I mean, I'd be curious to hear from both of you who, who are some favorite voices in food media that you listen to or that you read or who is impressing you right now? Like who is, who is doing those deep dives and getting those stories? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think Dave Cook does, who does the, the regional kind of street food is one guy that's, that's really good. Bill Estaza, who, who we just had on the show is going to be coming. I think he's, he's like a major guy. I think it has to be more people that are interested in, in street food because like the real fancy restaurants, I mean, they, they, they might get all the, the good uh, reviews, but you know, only 1% of the population likes that. And, and, and it's just really hard because the service came down a lot, you know, because you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that. So I think the mid price and the family restaurants and, and the low price things are very, very big. And, and, and restaurants that have only one product that they sell. You know, like yeah, because I, I think, what, and, and what my mom's alluding to, if correct me, I mean, people ask about trends. Like, what are, what are the trends? And my mom just gave you a couple of really awesome trends that are happening, right? Specializing in one, one item or regional cuisines and all of that, you know? But I just, I, I, you know, and, and I find it, I find it, uh, sometimes very challenging when you're like, okay, so cool. A lot of my 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 peers and colleagues in this industry are gringos, and they can open a restaurant, a Mexican restaurant. But if I open up a fresh restaurant, a French restaurant or Italian, I would get taken. They would critique the shit out of me. And then, but if you look at those restaurants, who's cooking the pasta at Babo? Mexicans. You know what I'm saying? You know, like. Who's really the workforce? Who's the backbone? And I know this narrative has been told before, but I'm just saying, here we are. No, you know? I mean, you put it perfectly in such a digestible way. It's uh, no pun intended. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> it's like, yeah, I mean, who do, you, who do you think is carrying out the vision of all of these different cuisines and chefs around the country? It's Latino workers for a lot of them. Um, and you, yeah, um, chefs with minority background are taking taken to task and questioned and critiqued in a way that a lot of white chefs have been privileged enough to evade, um, or they don't get the same amount of of that questioning. And and it's astounding the amount of ignorance that there is out there about foods and traditions and other and people who have a lot of a lot of pull. And then just keep on sending this information. It's very frustrating for us people who are scholars. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like I mean, mom, you're right to the point. That's a big, a big genesis of why I started my scholarship fund was I didn't want uh, culinary education to be the crutch or the reason why Latinos were not given executive positions and leadership positions in kitchens. I needed to cross that bridge, you know, and, 
and uh, you know, it happens from my mom being the example. My mom never complained, never said there was racism, never said any of that. My mom said, look, we're, we, this is who we are. I'm going to provide the best life I can for you, give you a great education, and develop your style. Those are some valuable lessons she gave us. But we never complained, never quejamos, none of that. You know, and I think right now we're living in a time where like, why am I not getting this? Or why is that not happening? And I'd be interested to think about your student base too, Lori. Talk to me. Are you hearing a little bit of that same narrative? Like, you know, why is this not happening? Or You know what I mean? Yeah, I was just talking with some people recently about how, you know, this generation of college students that we're teaching now, I mean, they have gone through a lonely period. You know, they've, some of them are coming back to college in person, you know, very recently. Some have transferred here from other places because of family circumstances or economic circumstances. And we really want to make sure that people don't fall through the cracks because they feel isolated and they don't feel like they have a community. And I've just become the director of our Latin American Study Center. And I think it's such a great, it's a great gig. Congratulations. Because, thank you. Um, it's wonderful because I can bring students together of different Latino backgrounds. We just had a mixer the other week. And to see that quantity of Latino students in one room together, I think people who thought, oh, I'm one of maybe two or three per class or when I walk um, through the quad. And maybe I think some people look like me, but a lot of them don't. It's it's powerful to see that you have community. And I think the more that you feel that, the more you feel motivated to be in a space of learning, of education, um, and, to, and learning in that broad sense, right? Like learning stuff in books and in lectures, but also learning more about yourself. Who are your people? What are you interested in? What are you passionate about? That's what college should be. And I hope we can get schools to feel more like that again, because I think some students have lost that, that feeling and we need to get it back. And, and food studies is definitely a fun thing to be able to teach and students really gravitate towards it. And what do you, the students like to, to teach? You know, because I'm astounded at how many people know who I am in the Latin community. And in the other community, I'm not well, I mean, I'm well known, but not like in the Latin community. The, the mama cooking, you know, yeah. That I'm supposed to, that, that I'm supposed to be giving them the opportunity to have a start, which I I, I never imagined because there was no press or anything like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's what makes me so happy that your papers are at Harvard. Like your papers are at a a really renowned college and university that is respected, and your papers are standing alongside the papers of famous women throughout history. I mean, it's such a, like, I feel so lucky I stumbled upon your papers because um, that's why we're talking today, right? Like I was able to write about your career and research about it and, and place you within that story of, of how food changed in one of the biggest cities in, in the world. And, um, and I feel so lucky because it introduced me to a whole new Kind of way of thinking how did we get here how did we get the variety of mexican food we have today it's because people took the chance to move to establish businesses to risk a lot with themselves and their families um to try to to make it uh in the food world well you know i, I have to tell you that i was so honored to read what you wrote about me and you know i i love, have a special uh quote from a play that I love of uh, it says, you know, what a gift the gods would give us to see ourselves as others see us. So that was like sort of the, my first opportunity to be to see how other people see me. And it was just a very important moment in my life because I've always felt that I didn't get that recognition. I mean I wasn't grumpy about it, but I was just like, how could they not understand, you know, all the work that I've done. But uh, but you gave me that recognition in, in that beautiful book, and I'm just really appreciative. It. it brought a lot of joy to my heart and and a lot of vindication, and I just really liked it. So thank you so very much. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, you're so right that we often don't get that aerial view of our life, 
um, from other people. It doesn't come around too often. Um, and, and while they're alive, by the way. While they're alive. <laughs> exactly. 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 I think that's also important. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't want to be morbid, but yes, that's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. And um, it's and that's the privilege of being a historian of people who are still around is that you can give them that gift. So um, that article is in the journal Food, Culture, and Society, and we can link to it um, in the notes about the show, and people can check it out. I think it's, it's a really good overview of what you were able to, to contribute. And also, not to mention that a single mom, not a lot of resources, you know, no excuses, you know? And I, you know, I tell people, like, you know, what was it? I'm like, well... If Tina Turner had a Mexican sister, it'd be my mom kind of thing. You know what I mean? As far as single-minded, wanting to tackle her goal. And, you know, and that's really interesting because, you know, had I been brought up by my father, I think my complete perspective in life would have been very different. But that I was brought up by a woman and a strong woman, that also informs how how I, I do business now. Everybody in our, in our team are all women that lead. All women that lead in, my, in our company. Well, look at what's I happening respond. in the government. Yeah, no, I respond, exactly. But I respond to that, you know? And that's a lot of my mom uh, influence, you know? And I just hope that the culinary kids now and people that are wanting to tackle this, this beautiful industry that has been so generous to our family go into it for the right reasons. You know, and I think, you know. I think that uh, the, uh, I was listening to Chris Christopherson and he was quoting, uh, I forget who his favorite is, uh, was saying about how if you're not doing something that you love, you're not living. And, you know, and, and that's, uh, that's, I've always believed in that. You know, when I, when I give motivational speeches, that's what I'd say. If you want to do this, you got to, you can't live without doing this. You've got to love it that much because it's a very, it's a very tough business, but. So, so rewarding in so many ways. No, and the best step, you know, your life will never be perfect, but it could be purposeful. You know what I mean? And you know, well, and, 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 you know, and that and that science, you know. Well, that's like my dad used to say to me. You know, the only sin in life is to waste your talents, and you and I, and you've been given lots of them, and it's your responsibility to develop them, and use them wisely and responsibly. So here I am in Quetzalcoatl, and there's so many so successful kids, and I'm so happy and proud of them. And and I was able to work. And then I wrote this book, and he said I never felt like a door latch kid. And that was a pr- proudest moment in my life. You know, like, like I was able to bring them up without them feeling like they were. Well, yeah, I read your memoir, Aaron. It's really moving, and it really helped me sort of put into context like the two perspectives, right, of the mom and then the kids. And how did that, because you two, you have a similar passion, but you went in different directions, both with your careers and the flavors and the cuisine, you know, the cuisine, what you want to bring out in the cuisine. Um, and so and I never thought, and, 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 and I'll tell you, and, and I hope you impress this upon your students, but I didn't feel, because my mom, it's a pain in the ass and beautiful <laughs> at the same time. But I didn't feel I couldn't tackle Mexican food till I was ready. Right. And I need to separate myself from my mom. And that's why I gravitated towards Nuevo Latino flavors and different things at that particular point in my life. Because I felt like I could do that and speak from a place of knowledge and a place of you know what I mean? And develop your uh, own style, which you yeah. have to have your and, own style. And then, then I tackle Mexican food later. Yeah. Is it still and called after I, Nuevo you know. Latino, or is does it have well, like yeah. another? No, it's still this. I'm mean, the same way. It was basically it was the idea of taking, um, you know, comida casera, home style food, and using uh, contemporary technique with with great ingredients. And take it to the next level. And, and Dobro Rodriguez was the pioneer of that. And Felipe Felipe uh, Lombardi Rojas was the pioneer of that. But so that that was kind of what I gravitated earlier in my career. And then, but and that, that kind of re- yeah, and redefining it. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's. 
home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. So, Lori, what do you hope for, you know, as you grow and what and what kind of curriculums you're putting forward to your students? Like, talk to us a little bit about that. Like, what are you excited about? Uh, well, I'm excited about sort of framing, because I'm starting to teach some classes in food history, right? But there is a way to go outside of history to include other disciplines and talk more broadly about what does food justice mean? Like, what does a just world when it comes to food look like. Um, you can bring up, of course, these global issues of hunger and nutrition, starvation, scarcity and abundance and inequality. Um, and you can scale that, you know, up or down, right? You can scale that to be a world problem. You can scale it to be a very local problem because there are inequalities, you know, at the micro level too. And I think once you start getting students and, you know, just people in general, for that matter, to start talking about those issues. Um, I think it really allows a lot of different people to have conversations with each other. Like you don't just need to be a historian. You don't just need to be a demographer or a sociologist or um, a chef or, you know, somebody who's, um, you know, using a f federal food assistance programs. Like everybody has something to learn from another person and and the perspectives combined I think really help because if we stay isolated into these silos where we're talking about these issues in our own little groups but not figuring out how we can help one another you know offer perspective offer like labor offer help offer solutions um, then I think you know the problem will, will persist and and food justice as a goal won't ever get more defined. Like I, I really admire that now it is in the vocabulary more food justice as a thing, as a form of empowerment, food sovereignty is also another phrase we're hearing more now um, in different communities. So having people be able to be more in control of, of their food, the food that they need and also the food that they love and want. Like this man in Chapas told me, not in Chapas, it will have a said to me. ¿Cómo le ha ido con la crisis? Mi crisis, aquí no hay crisis. Tengo una tierrita y le pongo mi maíz, mi chifón, siempre hay tomate, muchas papas y mucho chile. And that's all I need con tortilla. So, you know, you, you can have a, a basic diet that's not it's nutritious, but not as... Right, that's you know, heritage basic. and that's indigenous and... and Everything indigenous in perspective. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah put it in perspective. Na native and local and and things that were meant to keep growing, like ingredients that were meant to stay on this earth. We need to make sure that they stay. I love the fact that you said silo. Don't live in a silo. I think that was brilliant. And this idea of food sovereignty, like who really has ownership over ingredients? Like, you know, those are really, really neat terms that can, you know, can, I think, make up a, a whole class or two classes. I think really interesting stuff. That's uh, like the I seed just, bags that they know. have in Oaxaca. You know, like, if let's say a man is going to, to leave to, to try to work in the United States. They have this, he can go deposit samples of the seed. So if he comes back, he can just go plant them again. But at the same time, they're there for, for other people to use if they have to. 
yeah, it's like these archives of seeds. Like if we think about like banking them, keeping them protected, yeah, that's what they are. And that's totally out there. Yeah. No, and I mean, I mean, in a cryptic way, I, I, I saw this documentary about people that are doing that in case of an apocalypse apocalyptic situation where they, people have seeds that they can plant in, in case uh, everything's foobarred, you know what I'm saying? Like, pretty interesting stuff, but... It's super interesting. And just the fact yeah. that we call certain things heirloom, yeah. heir, heirlooms, I, I think it's such yeah. a beautiful word. It's something to be passed down. It's something to be... Protected. Well, that's a great, it's a great term. Okay, so this is how I, I interpret the word heirloom, right? So at one point, there was 50 uh, varieties of tomatoes, just throwing an arbitrary number out there, right? And then as things started to kind of be condensed and everything, there was the convenience factor, uh, demand, everything, all those heirloom varieties fell to the wayside because everything had to be streamlined. And now they're being rediscovered and brought back, right? So that's kind of like how it's happening so I think people don't understand the word heirloom and how 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 that really relates to in, to food and ingredients. Are, am I correct in saying that? No, you know what I mean. Like right. And now the playbooks open up. Yeah, that, that, that's a, I think the role of the green market that they have a, they have a role in, in biodiversity, which is one of my passions. Yeah, because they keep up right. new potatoes, new uh, apples, and and. Uh, and not enough train rides because it's almost, oh, no, no, we have a few minutes. Yeah. No, but, I, and also, farm to table is not a genre, knuckleheads. It's your job, right? <laughs> it's been happening since the beginning of time. Procure the best ingredients closest to you and manipulate them the least, right? I, and, you know, so farm to table, I don't understand that concept as far as it pertains to a restaurant because it should be your responsibility, Correct. You know, it's like a chef-driven restaurant, a chef-driven restaurant, as opposed to like a dishwasher-driven restaurant. Like, what are we talking about here? You know what I mean? Like, let's get, let's get our shit straight here. No, sorry, I just went on a die trap. Sorry. We haven't let Go Lori ahead. speak. We haven't let Lori speak. We've no, it's Lori speaking. Sorry. Oh no, no, I'm ha- I'm having a great time. <laughs> no, no, no. So again, so you talked a little bit about yeah, about yeah, about what you want to get accomplished and, and all yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, I think just getting people to, and young people, right? Because they will be the ones who are, you know, going to have those future careers in all different industries, including the food industry, and getting them to think more communally. You know, I I don't want to believe that we're entering a more selfish period in humanity. I want to believe that we're going to keep thinking about each other, about the world, about what we're going to protect for each other. Um, ingredients are one of them, those heirlooms we need to take back out of the, the cabinets and the archives and, and preserve and use, um, and just be healthier communities, you know, in the food we ingest and the way we treat each other. There was a beautiful article in the Times recently about people getting together to make kimchi and, ha- and how that is an absolutely community activity. Did you see it? Cool. I didn't see it, but I'm going to go check it out. That sounds really cool. Maybe? Yeah, no, Mom, because you're going to get mad at me because I'm talking all the time. You know? <laughs> now, 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 you know what I mean? <laughs> see, now I'm not going to say anything. Now okay, he's keeping You know quiet. what I mean? See, that, that, that's how Mom is, you know? You see how moms are? But you can see a little bit of dynamic, I, you know? Anyway, I mean, Lori. <laughs> Miss Lori, Professor Lori. Um, if people want to... Wanted to get in touch, and how do people continue to have this? Because we like to say on um, Cooking in Mexican from A to Z, by the way, brought to you by Heritage Radio Network. Uh, you can go on heritageradionetwork.org to get all this wonderful information and, and other podcasts, and, and they have a beautiful catalog of other really talented people that have their own their own shows and all that, but... How can people engage with you? Because we like to say the conversation's never over. It's just continuing. Yeah, I, I love that. Yes, the conversation continues. You can find me on my website, lauriaflores.com. You can find me on Twitter at Lori underscore Flory. 
And uh, you can look at my digital restaurant map, um, that love letter to Mexican food in New York. Uh, uh, it's a story map that we'll link to in the, in the podcast, the notes for this show. Great. It was wonderful. so wonderful to have you on. Thank you so very much. Oh, thank you no, all. Brilliant. It was so nice. No, we, we, but I think, Mom, we have to have Miss Lori back and talk about some of the, 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 the topics that we, we kind of surfacely touched, like food sovereignty, you know, food stability, all of that. Because that's a whole other subject that we can go on Yeah, to. you can take each right. one and talk. Yeah, know, yeah, exactly. Forever. But, but please keep everybody aware of what you're going, what, what you're doing in the curriculums. And I'm sure my mom would love to come up and maybe speak at one of your classes. And, yeah. and I'm offering my services, too, as well. Where are so you based anything now? We could do. I don't know. Are you I'm based in, in New Orleans? In New Orleans. In New Orleans. Yeah, that's all. So my sister lives there. So the next time I'm there, hopefully we can meet up or something. Yeah. Very, very, anytime you want. We're there for y'all. Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias. Cooking in Mexican from A to Z is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.